Good morning, Faith Family Chapel. Uh, it's Jay Guinan, and uh, we just want to thank God that he's given us this technology that helps us accommodate when we have some problems. I am feeling better today, uh, but uh, as uh, we have a rule in the church, if you got a sniffle, you got a cough, a cold, or whatever, stay home. So I am doing this from home, and I uh, hope your Christmas went very well. We're going to pick it up this morning in uh, Corinthians 10. Uh, we'll start with our scripture. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Father, we thank you for the message. We thank you for the words that you've left behind. We ask that they penetrate our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul keeps hitting the same thing over and 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 over. I'm not seeking for my own good, but for the good of many. And you just got to ask yourself when... People we know have made choices that they've made. Were they making those choices for the good of many or just their own? Right? This is, and this is why, I, you know, people are, you're really harsh, Jay. You're really harsh. You know, people should have the right to do what they want. And the, the answer is no. Actually, as a Christian, we lost that right. We forfeited that right. And we became a slave to Christ in such a manner that, uh, I'm not allowed to seek for my own good anymore, but only for the many, right? And it's, this is what's be, what becoming a real Christian looks like. And so, uh, how do you know when that happens? Well, when the rubber meets a road, when the tough times really happen, who, who are you more focused on, yourself or the many? So, keep that in the back of your mind as we start talking uh, this morning about 1 Corinthians 10. And we're going to Pick up where we left off in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners race, but only one gets the prize? We talked about that, right? He, Paul is talking uh, like people that are running a race, and he's saying, look, everyone that enters the race knows that only one person can win, but they all run as if they can win. They are all trying to win, run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that lasts forever. Going into strict training. Strict training could be, am I making decisions for myself or am I making decisions for others, right? Therefore, I do not run like someone aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And that's a key point here. Anyone in ministry Anyone that's leading any kind of uh, group or people or ministry, this is even more important to you. It is more important that you are an example, as in, hey, I feel pretty good today, to be honest, but I made a rule that said if you don't feel well for any reason, you got to stay home. Well, I stayed home because it's more important to basically uphold my walk and my talk than it is for me to appease myself, which is I could have gone and done my lesson at, at church. Get the idea? That's kind of where Paul is going. You can take control over your own body. You take control over your own direction, and you need to make a decision. Am I going to be doing what I'm doing for me or for those around me? And so we're going to get into 1 Corinthians 10, and, and here's the overview. First, he's going to give us a history lesson of what happened to Israel, um, and uh, I think it'll apply to us still today. Uh, he's going to talk about the consequences about grumbling, okay? Uh, people grumble in the church. People make decisions because of grumbling that goes on in the church. And then he's going to come back around to his favorite topic, it appears, is be selfless. Be selfless. Don't be selfish, okay? Verse 1, 1 Corinthians 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. What he's talking about here is when God, through Moses, uh, basically saved all of Israel from Egypt, right? And he uh, took them out through the, the sea uh, and uh, protected them. And by day he went as a cloud and by night he he appeared as a pillar of fire. So this is what he's talking about. He's, he's referencing them, and you can find that in Exodus uh, pretty much uh, 13 and 14, right? 
Exodus 13, 21, and the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud to guide their way by day and by a pillar of fire to give them light by night so that they could travel by day and night, right? 14, 22, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with walls of water on their right and on their left. So anyone that's talking about modern uh, historians are like, well, it's possible that they could have walked through the a portion of the Dead Sea when it was a really dry season and there was no rain and they basically, you know, kind of went through a puddle. Well, that's not the description, right? The description is there were walls of water on their right and on their left. Well, what, what does a wall of water look like? How, how big is a wall of water? And I think most of us would equate it to like something in our house. It's, you know, going to be eight, nine, ten feet tall, a wall of water. So not a puddle, a true miracle, 1429. But the Israelites had walked through the sea on dry ground with walls of water on their right and on their left. So clearly something miraculous happened that Israel was able to witness for themselves. And then he continues in verse 2. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, the word baptized here does mean baptism as we would know it, but that's not how it should be applied here. It doesn't mean they were baptized into Moses like we're baptized into Jesus. It means that they were under Moses' authority, under Moses' a command, which is a part of our baptism. Confession, when we make that confession, we're committing ourselves to the authority of the one we accept that baptism from, right? But they didn't have baptism here, but it was... A symbology. We went through the sea with Moses. We agreed to fall under Moses' command. Okay, and so that's kind of how they would approach that. Verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. So spiritual food, we find that in Exodus 16, verse 4. Uh, because when they left, they were told to leave without anything, right? Just, you know, pack a bag and go. So it's not like they prepared for a very long journey. Uh, so God has to take care of everything. In Exodus 16, verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Each day the people are to go out and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test whether or not they will follow my instructions. So they go out without any food, and there isn't any food, and they start, believe it or not, grumbling because they don't have food. And God says, Okay, I'm going to bring food, and I'm going to give you some very specific instructions about that food. Okay? And we're going to pick that up in in Exodus 16, verse 15. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. So Moses told them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. In verse 35, the Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to a land where they could settle. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. And the word manna, manna is the, is the name that the Israelites assigned to the bread of that the Lord had provided. It was called manna. And guess what that means in, in the Hebrew, manna? It means, what is it? <laughs> kind of funny. You know, they named it like what, it, what they thought. Well, what is this? Well, that's what manna means. That's what we're going to call it. We'll call it manna. And he gave them some very specific instructions about manna, right? One of the things he said was that they were to go out and only gather as much as they could, and then they were to consume it, and uh, all of it, because by the next day, it would be rancid, okay? And so most individuals did that, but there were some that didn't, and it, it'll say in Scripture that in the morning it was filled with maggots and it was rancid, right? So God gave very, very specific instructions about how to deal with the manna. Okay, keep continuing on. Four, and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Now, so... Paul is basically coming back around and saying that Christ has been part of the plan the whole time, that Christ was there during that time. And we're going to find this in Exodus 17, where the Lord says, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And that's when, that's how they got their water, right? So there was no water where they went, and Moses would take the staff that God gave him, and he would strike the rock, and the rock would immediately start pouring out water. How would you think about that? I mean, look, you get food to eat every day, and you get water by striking a rock. I, I would assume, okay, you would be able to witness that God was a mighty God, and that God was 
working powerfully in their lives, and it would give you no cause for any concern, right? That's kind of what I would think would happen. But unfortunately, because we're human beings, no, 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 no. We All we did was complain. And it gets picked up here at the end of verse four, 5. Here we go. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And he was not pleased because all they did was grumble against the Lord. They grumbled. They got manna, and that wasn't good enough. And, and, and the manna was, you know, the description of manna was like it was honey. It was sweet. It was delicious. It was like having the, the best candy bar every day that you loved and never running out of it, and it was still not enough. It was still not enough. And because of that, they grumbled against God. They grumbled against Moses and the leaders. They grumbled against themselves constantly, and that displeased God to the point where God basically punished them. He dis they displeased him to the point where he decided, okay, I have to punish you. And so here's where we're going to pick that up uh, in Numbers 14, verse 26. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall, every one of you, 20 years old or more, who has counted in the census, uh, who has grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of uh, Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. So remember, we talked about this last week, that the estimate is two to three million Israelites were freed from I Israel. So there's two to three Israelites walking around in the desert. And of the two to three million, sorry, two to three million Israelites, of the two to three million Israelites walking around in the desert, the Bible says only two, only two of those over the age of 20. Okay, now that's the caveat here. We covered that uh, last week that it says, every one of you 20 years old or more. So those that were under the age of 20 uh, were not... Uh, convicted of, of the sin, only those 20 and older, which kind of gives you an indication, and I'm not going to go real deep here, but age of accountability. You know, age of accountability 21 is in the United States, and that is because it comes from the scripture here over the age of 20, right? By that time, you're, you're capable of making decisions. According to physiological evidence, your brain is not really prepared or completed uh, in its um, development until you reach the age of about 21, okay? So this is kind of interesting that God would do that. Uh, and the only two adults that he saves is Caleb and Joshua. Everyone else, including including more, uh, Moses and Aaron, don't make it into the promised land. He continues, As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. So God has protected the children, but he is going to punish the adults. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year of each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I'm oh, sorry, I know what it's like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community, which is banded together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness. Here they will die. Two to three million people. God is basically going to put to the test. And essentially, they will die in their wickedness. This should be a warning sign for all of us as well, because this is what Paul is referencing to the church in Corinth. He's referencing this for a specific reason, because they're doing the same thing. They're grumbling against God. They're disobeying their God. They're forgetting who their God is, and they just assume that their God is going to, you know, look the other way forever. And that's not the truth. That doesn't happen that way. You are still responsible, even though covered by the blood, you are responsible for the actions that you do here while you are on the earth and in the body of God. You have a responsibility. 
If you continue to grumble, if you are unfaithful, if you uh, are wicked, you are going to suffer consequences. You will suffer them not only here, but perhaps in heaven as well. And that's where Paul is going with this message. He's basically trying to bring it to their attention. Look, you know the history of, of uh, Israel. You need to pay attention because you don't want this happening to you. See, that, that's part of what I think is going on in the modern church. See, the modern church says, oh, you're fine. You're covered by the blood. Don't worry about it. Oh, if you, if you sin, don't worry. Just, you know, God will forgive you and go on. Oh, if you sin again, it's a... No, that's not how it works. That's a lie, and those perpetrating that lie will be punished. It's a lie. God expects you to become holy. I can, you know, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of scriptures that Jesus talks about becoming holy. You should become holy. Well, if I'm becoming holy, it's the opposite of sinful. So I can't be sinful. Amen? Picking it back up, verse 6 of uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Okay? So Paul is saying, listen, the examples that are in the Bible, all of the punishments, all of the blessings, all of the things that took, in the, that took place in the Bible it, it are examples for each and every one of us that are new creations in Christ. It's not like a book. It's not a narrative. It's not something we just throw away because, oh, it doesn't apply to us. No, they're examples for us to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things. Now he goes on in verse 7, Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up and indulge in revelry. We found that in Exodus 32, 4, when they build the calf. God, Moses goes up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and Aaron basically takes all the gold that everyone provides and, and builds a calf that they're all worshiping. Don't do that. Verse 8, We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, in one day, 23,000 of them died. Did you get that? One day, God offed 23,000. One day. You find that in Numbers 25. While Israel was staying in Shittim, uh, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the, dollars of, the daughters of Moab and spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you led us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water, and we detest this wretched food. So the Lord sent ven oh sorry, that's venomous snakes. I went too far. Uh, so uh, the sexual immorality was Numbers 25, uh, verse 1. Okay, sorry, I jumped ahead. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did when they were killed by snakes. Okay, snakes, 21, 5 through 6. Uh, and the men spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you led us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water, and we detest this wretched food. So they're talking about the manna that they were provided. We detest it. So the Lord sent venomous snakes among the people, and many of the, of the Israelites were bitten and died. So God had said, okay, I'm done hearing this. So he sent snakes in to kill the people. And the only way that the people would not die from the venomous snake bite was that Moses would hold a staff above his head and you had to keep your eyes on that staff. If you kept your eyes on that staff, you would basically be protected. Anytime the staff fell or Moses' arms fell, people would die. Okay? And so it was kind of a, a symbology here of God saying, keep your eyes on me always. If you take your eyes off me, you die. Right? Very simple message. Well, it still applies today. If you take your eyes off of God, if you take your eyes off of what his plan and his desires are for you, and you put them back on you, you die. And you might even, see, we assume it could be, you know, if it was a, a quick death, everyone would be, like, oh, my gosh. But it doesn't have to be a quick death. I mean, these are just quick deaths. It could be a very slow, painful death. It could be like I go back out in the world and I start falling into sin slowly and it starts creeping into my life and it starts permeating the way I am. And before I know it, 10, 20 years later, I am a completely lost creature again. It could be like that. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Verse 10, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. And we're going to pick that up in uh, verse 2, 2, 2. 16 of Numbers, where he's talking about Korah. 
and Kor Kor gets a bunch of his people together, and they grumble against again Moses and Aaron and everyone, and they're angry. And God says, "Yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, separate Korah from the rest, and I'll deal with them." And he uh, he basically opens the ground and swallows all 250 of the members of Korah, who were Levites, right? They were supposed to be the priests of God. And uh, he basically kills them off. Um, but in, in doing so, he was so angry, he also created a plague. And a, the plague killed 14, 147, uh, sorry, 14,700 people in the same day, right? Uh, and again, they had to keep their eyes on Moses in order to protect themselves, okay? So... God's, God's uh, mercy and grace has some boundary lines where at some point he's just done with you. He's just going to not deal with you here on the, on the earth like that. So don't test him, right? It says don't test your Lord your God. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples were written down as warning for us. So Paul's repeating himself on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you, what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So there's a lot going on here. First, he's kind of repeating himself. Look, all these things were an example to you. They were just as applicable then as they are applicable now. Okay? So... You're not, you need to take God seriously. I mean, just because we haven't seen God act like that in a very, very long time does not mean he won't or could not act like that, okay? He warns you about standing firm, right? If you think you are standing firm, be careful. And that's the biggest problem we have. My, my ego can get in the way where I think I know it all, where I know more. And it doesn't matter what, you know, Scripture says, I know better, and I allow myself to become the focus of my life as opposed to Bible and, and God. And we're going to see that in uh, Philippians 2, Paul warns us. He's like, listen, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, uh, to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why would I have to, if I'm covered completely 100%, 100% of the time, and there's nothing that I can do that cause myself any more harm because of the blood of Christ, why would I have to, why would I have to, right, work out my salvation with fear and trembling? That makes no sense. Well, it does, because we lie to ourselves. We we think one way, but in in, in fact, we do the opposite if you're not living a life where you're becoming selfless and you are selfish, if you make decisions for your own good and not the good of others, always, uh, you need to be able to, you better start working out your salvation, friend, because you're just lying to yourself. And as God has proven, he doesn't put up with that nonsense. So we're going to return back. Now, no temptation, verse 13, has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Okay, so what God is saying is, you know, this, the devil made me do it crap that we all quote. No, that's, that's a load of hooey. The devil doesn't make you do squat. There is nothing in, in mankind that, uh, that's new, okay? It is what's been here since the beginning of time, and it's common. It's why Jesus was able to become the perfect sacrifice because he lived a perfect life. He was uh, tested by all of the same human temptations that we uh, are tested by daily. Um, the exception, he didn't fail. It, he did not allow it to overtake him. And even when you feel like you are, are helpless and powerless, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it, right? God always provides you a way out. It, do, it doesn't mean he takes the temptation out of your life. It just means he gives you another way away from the temptation. And, and the, you know, uh, the most popular scripture should be 
flee from sin. Flee. If I'm walking towards sin and I recognize it as sin, run away. Flee. That's a way out. God always gives you a way out. So when you are being tempted, you have to basically ask the question, what's my way out, God? And look for that way out. First of all, we have to, we have to understand we're being tempted, right? Uh-oh, that's, uh-oh, that could be bad. And second, we have to make the decision not to want to be tempted instead of, oh, well, maybe I'll give in to that. But it's okay. No one's here. No one's watching. No one cares. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's just me. This is fine. God will understand. Nope. So I recognize I'm being tempted. I make a decision I don't want to be tempted. And then I look for my get out of temptation card. Well, how do I get out of this? And in most cases, just flee, walk, turn, go away, get away from it. If you look at how many things you are tempted in your, in your lifetime, you'll find that if you turn off that TV or change that, that channel or change that computer or walk away from that individual or get up and leave from that situation, that's enough. That's generally enough. But you have to make the decision. God is not going to make that decision for you. He's testing you. He's testing to see how his creation is doing. Do you fail the test? Verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always... Op- oh, we already covered this. Sorry, that's Philippians 2. Verse 18. Consider the people of Israel. Okay, so he's going back and referencing what we've just learned. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar. Okay, he talked about that earlier in verse 9 when uh, we talked about the Levites were to, you know, to eat uh, a part of the uh, uh, gifts that were provided by Israel to God, right? That was how they got their food. That's how they got their, their income. And they were, you know, they shared in that. Do I mean that the food sacrificed to an owl is anything or that an idol is anything, right? So now he's coming around and, and bringing it back to the pagans and basically the answering the question, which we think he had, hey, we have a problem. We have a bunch of... Uh, people that are concerned that when we go to the market and we buy food that could have potentially been um, sacrificed to a pagan god and we eat it, is that bad or is that not bad, right? So he's kind of getting back around to this. We covered that in verse 9, but he's, he's finishing up. Do I mean that the food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? And the answer is no. No, that food is not a problem. Uh, idol, there are, the idols are nothing but man-made gizmos. There are no, you know, gods or demons or things that are greater than God. This is not an issue. No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, right? So that's where he hits it. He goes, they're demons that have tempted you to become uh, an idol worshiper. They're tempting you to take your eyes off God. And he says, and, do, and I do not want you to be participants with demons, So what does that kind of mean? Well, what he's kind of saying to you is this. Listen, if you go and you eat food, which is what he told you in verse 9, if you go and you're offered food, just eat it and don't think anything of it. But if you go and you're offered food and you know it's been given to idols, then don't eat it. Then don't eat it. There's nothing wrong with the food and there's nothing... There's nothing that it, can, that it can do, but it's your outward appearance. So you, you want to uphold the appearance. You, you have, you have a, uh, a responsibility to be a good representative. And someone that's knowingly eating food that is being sacrificed to demons uh, is not. Even though the food does nothing to you, it, you're not being uh, a good representative. And so we could, we could do this in, in such a manner uh, you know, if you're out and about and, uh, you know, you're around people that don't think Christians should drink, well, maybe you shouldn't drink while you're in that situation and be a good example. Or you shouldn't use foul language and you could be a good example. Or you shouldn't you talk about coarse dro- joking, be a good example. Because it's not that it's that those are things that are harming you, but it's the, the which they do, by the way, but that's not the point. The point is, that your example to the world becomes tarnished. Your example to the world becomes tarnished. Okay? Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part of both the Lord's table and the table of demons. 
Are you trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So he's kind of getting back around here where he started in, in the beginning. Look, if you don't know what you if you don't know anything, don't worry about it. But if you find out, right, then you can't participate. Is kind of where he's getting to in regards to this food offered by demons. Offered, uh, sorry, to the demons or the pagans or whatever, right? Being sacrificed. So if you're if you're invited and you don't know anything, it's okay. Don't ask questions, okay? And then your conscience is clear. But if if along the way someone says, oh, yeah, um, by the way, this was sacrificed to, you know, X, Y, Z, then you have to kind of go, oh, well, I, I can't participate. Not because the food is going to harm you, but because the whole example that you're setting uh, does harm God, right? It, it makes God look bad. So that's kind of what he's getting here. Verse 23, and he goes on, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. So what he's saying is, look, you can do anything you want, but not everything is beneficial, being selfless versus selfish. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but for the good of others. Did you get that? I mean, he keeps hammering this thing home, guys. So when people leave our church for their own reasons, they're not seeking the good of others. They're seeking their own good. When people don't want to participate in a ministry for their own reasons, when people don't want to fellowship with other brothers and sisters for their own reasons, when people don't want to give their gifts to the church for their own reasons, they're not seeking the, the good of others. They're seeking their own good. And they make excuses for themselves that they assume everyone should just accept. And the answer is no. And then I'll get, well, it's so harsh that you keep talking about this. Well, you know why I keep talking about this? Because we're supposed to bring that up as an example for others not to do it. And the Bible says to shame them. Right? It's, if we had done things like this, which is pure biblical um, uh, accountability or discipline, we wouldn't have had these problems. You have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. You know, I, I heard of a member in our church that, you know, liked to participate in smoking dope and basically went to a co-worker who doesn't go to church but knows that this individual went to church and, you know, bought dope from them and then wondered why this person was all upset with them. Like, I can't believe they bought dope from me. Well, because they had an expectation that you were a Christian. They had an expectation that you didn't smoke or buy dope. They had an expectation of what a Christian looks like, and you blew it. You blew it. You blew it. This is what I'm talking about. And did anyone, did anyone deal with that particular Christian on that behalf? No, we didn't. We kind of just looked the other way because we didn't want to make waves. We didn't want to cause anybody problems. We, we you know... Well, they have their own free will. Yeah, no, that, that's our mistake. And I can guarantee you that ain't going to happen again. It, it's, it's not the right thing to do, and that's not what we're going to do. You have the right to do anything, but make sure it's beneficial for others, not yourself. Amen? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 25. So he goes on and he explains what, I, what we were talking about regarding the food. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising question of client conscience for the earth is the lord's and everything in it we get that from acts 10 when peter basically had a vision of god and and all the food that god brought down on uh, on a sheet right it says about noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city peter went up on the roof to pray he became hungry and wanted something to eat and while the meal was being prepared he fell into a trance he saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure, unclean. Remember, so in the Old Testament, there was a, a complete list of all the foods you could eat and all the foods you couldn't eat. And on, on the list of things you could not eat, uh, there were things, reptiles and birds and certain kind of uh, animals with certain kind of hooves. 
I've never eaten anything impure and clean. And the voice spoke to him a second time and said, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Do not make it. So God has made everything clean. Whatever God makes is clean. So Paul's basically saying, look, if you, you go in the meat market, just buy it and eat it. It's food. But he continues. 27. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever it is before you without raising questions or conscience. But, the caveat, if someone says to you, this has been offered to sacri in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and the sake of your conscience. I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. Meaning, it's not about you, it's now about the example that you are laying before that person who may be trying to check you He's basically saying, oh, you're eating this food. That's great. You know, it was sacrificed to this particular God. And in his mind, he knows you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be uh, wanting to eat that. Isn't that against your rules? Similar to this guy. And maybe this guy was even in time. Hey, I got some pot. I got some dope. You want to you wanna buy some dope? He could have been doing it just to test this other Christian, knowing he was a Christian or she was a Christian. Okay could have been trying to test them. And you're not supposed to partake. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So it's not about your conscience when this happens. When this thing happens and you find out about it, then you have to back off. It's not about that the food is bad. It's not that you're bad, but it's that you're setting an example for the other person in the environment there. And finally, in verse 31, he says, So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jew, Greek, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. That is the final message that should be our walk for the week. I am not seeking my own good, but for the good of many, so that they may be saved. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jew, Greek, or the Church of God. And that's the part we've been dealing with. We've had, we've had what we call good people making very selfish decisions and not taking into consequence what is happening. Because it's not about what they're doing to others. It's about what they're doing for them. And I don't care how you slice it and dice it. That's the truth of the matter. And that is a very immature Christian. That's still a carnal Christian, someone who's still in the world seeking to please themselves because that's what babies do. Babies just want to seek pleasure. They want to please themselves. It's adults that have to be selfless. Like I watched Diana yesterday. She was you know, sick. And while we're all sitting around doing nothing, she's cleaning and putting things away and bringing out the desserts and doing all of the things, even though she doesn't feel well and really probably just wanted to curl up on the couch and take a nap. But that's what mature Christians do. The mature Christian continues to serve others, continues to see where they can be good for others. Where the baby Christian is like... I just want to be with my family. Well, I need a place that's just best for me. Or I just want to, you know, go here because it has more stuff. It, that's all I heard. I, 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 I. Like I said, when your conversations begin with, well, I, yeah, that's already a mistake. <laughs> because nobody cares about I. God doesn't care about I. It's about the good of others. Amen? All right, Father, we thank you for the message. We thank you uh, for for uh, all of the examples that you provided us. We ask that those never fall upon our own heads. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, have a good time.